Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started with uh, demystifying uh, IMSI, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn the stage over to Kosher. All right. Kosher. Yep. Thanks. Uh, I am uh, Carl Kosher. Uh, I'm a research scientist at the uh, University of Washington, uh, where I study uh, wireless and embedded system security. Uh, ham radio operator. Uh, I'm an amateur extra. My call sign as of a month ago is KYOLO. Um, just for the lulls. Um, and as the academics say, this is joint work with Peter Ney, who is a PhD student at the University of Washington. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here because he's busy writing his dissertation right now, um, but he also does uh, research in um, security and biohacking. So what are NZ catchers? Um, these are uh, known as uh, cell site simulators. Um, they're used by law enforcement, intelligence, uh, militaries around the world. And they're uh, shrouded in extre extreme secrecy. Um, people will often call them stingrays, um, but that's just a particular brand of MZ catcher. Um, it's one of the most popular ones, especially in the US. Um, so that's a term that people sometimes use. But um, more broadly, they're, they're just called MZ catchers. And the, the name comes from uh, the IMSI, which is the International Mobile Subscriber Identifier, which is the identifier for your SIM card that these MZ catchers use to identify you. So there's a lot of speculation about the capabilities of MZ catchers. Um, so, you know, are they being used to collect MZs of people in a particular area? Um, are they using these to localize phones? Are they using them to intercept content? Um, are they using them to exploit a phone and turn them into remote bugs? Well, who knows? Um, but we're going to try to uh, dig through uh, some of the available materials and try to find out. Um, these are originally designed for use in highly adversarial environments. So things like war zones uh, and uh, unfriendly countries, things like that. But then something interesting started happening. And uh, DHS and the FBI started uh, uh, equipping local law enforcement with these devices. Um, and this has raised the attention of um, some senators in Congress, uh, especially uh, Senator Wyden from Oregon. Um, so in 2016, uh, a group of 12 senators wrote a letter to the FBI asking uh, about the legal authority of using MZ catchers, um, whether they could interfere with 911 services, and uh, if the FCC tested uh, uh, the uh, MZ catchers to see if they would interfere with 911 service and asking um, what's up with this NDA with the FBI. And the FCC basically said that since MZ catchers are used in coordination with the FBI, and I'll get into that in a minute, um, federal government rules to not causing interference don't really apply in this case. Um, so, you know, it's fine. Um, but, you know, Wyden continued to press the FCC, Department of Justice, and Homeland Security about this. And something very interesting came out um, about a year ago. So he sent a request uh, asking, has DHS seen evidence of foreign MZ catchers in, here in DC? And uh, if yes, what happened? And basically DHS said that um, they have observed anomalous activity in the national capital region that appears to be consistent with MZ catchers, um, but they didn't attribute or validate it, uh, and they reported it. And then he asked, um, does DHS have the technical capability to detect these MZ catchers, and uh, what are they doing about it? And basically, they said that they were running a pilot program, and they don't really have any te technical capabilities to detect uh, these MZ catchers. Um, and I guess kind of worded it to say, like, you know, if you gave us some funding, maybe we could figure something out. Um, it went on a, a little bit more. Um, a couple of things to um, uh, highlight from this letter to him. Um, so, as I said, they had this pilot project for most of 2017 to uh, go around the DC area and look for NZ catchers. Um, they noted that they found some anomalous activity in uh, areas like the White House, um, but basically they couldn't um, validate or attribute them at all. Um, so, quickly going into the legal framework of MZ catchers. Um, so, uh, as background, uh, I want to talk about uh, pin registers and uh, trap and trace um, devices uh, versus wiretaps. Um, so, 
uh, and um, I'll explain why those are, are legally relevant uh, in, in a minute. So originally, a pen register was this device that was used to log um, uh, telegraph transmissions uh, with Morse code. And what people figured out is you could actually hook this up to a, an analog rotary phone line and use that to log numbers that were being recorded. And so a pen register was used, to, uh, used by law enforcement to attach to a phone line and record numbers that were being dialed. And um, through various uh, precedents, um, basically it was ruled that this is not a, a Fourth Amendment search. You don't actually need a warrant to do this. Um, there, there's something called the third party doctrine where if you give information uh, to a third party, um, uh, you no longer need a, a, a warrant to, to search it. Um, and uh, there's this law from um, the 80s called the Electronic uh, Communications Privacy Act that basically says you just need a court order uh, and the only standard is that it's relevant to an ongoing criminal investigation. Um, and uh, the way the third party doctrine here sort of applied is they made the argument that back in the good old days, you picked up the phone and you talked to the operator and you told the operator who you want to call. And because you were freely volunteering that information to the phone company, they could just go and subpoena uh, that information from the phone company. Now, nowadays you don't actually talk to anyone, you send it electronically, but they said, well, that's kind of the same thing. So we'll, we'll still say it, um, um, this dialed number uh, collection is, is still the same. Um, trap and trace devices uh, are sort of the inverse of pen registers. Um, so instead of recording what numbers you are calling, it records what numbers are calling you. Um, and this is sort of uh, in the same legal realm as uh, pen registers. Um, so they're, they're usually lumped together. Um, in contrast, wiretaps, where you actually intercept content and not signaling information or metadata, uh, like the pen registers or tra trap and traces, is considered a search and does require a warrant. Um, so the Department of Justice has this uh, electronic surveillance guide from 2005 that they put up on their site. And basically, they say that uh, uh, cell site simulators, or trigger fish, as they called them back in back then uh, were capable of intercepting uh, content and uh, must be configured to not do that unless you um, have a warrant. Um, but then they also say that um, uh, you can use these devices to capture uh, the electronic serial number or uh, uh, MIN, the mobile identifier um, of old analog phones um, because it's metadata like the um, dialed numbers that were collected uh, with uh, pen, uh, pen registers and uh, trap and trace devices. So the, the legal theory here was that since this is just metadata and signaling of information, you're good to go to collect it um, with just a court order. However, um, after, after a lot of uh, this has come out over the past few years, uh, some jurisdictions now do require warrants um, some uh, do that through statutes, so Washington, California, Mer or Virginia, Minnesota, Utah, and others um, ha explicitly have statutes that say you need a warrant to uh, use these MC catchers. In other places like Maryland, there's case law that basically says um, you need a warrant to, to uh, use these MC catchers. Um, and as of 2015, the Department of Justice um, guidance for federal investigations uh, suggests obtaining a warrant because uh, courts are getting uh, increasing or demanding them uh, increasingly. Um, so even with with warrants, are they still legal to use? I mean, they they're transmitting a rogue signal uh, and possibly interfering with the cell network. And uh, to understand that, we go back to the good old Communications Act of 1934. Um, and there's a couple of relevant provisions in there. Um, Basically, there's, there is one provision that says um, uh, it is prohibited to manufacture, import, make, sale, or operate a device not meeting FCC regulations, including those causing harmful interference. Um, there's another provision that says, or that prohibits willful or malicious interference with radio communications. 
there are a couple of regulations, one that says you need to acquire equipment authorization from the FCC uh, prior to selling these devices. Um, but there's also another exception that says basically you don't need that if it's for US government um, use. However, um, uh, the uh, MZ catcher manufacturers had a bit of a problem because uh, local governments did not fall under that uh, exception um, like the, the federal government did. And so something interesting happened. Um, Harris, who makes the Stingrays, uh, submitted a uh, request to the FCC for an equipment authorization for these Stingray devices, which do intentionally interfere with radio communications. And then something very interesting happened. Ooh, this is hmm, blown out a bit. Well, oh well. Um, but basically, it's a, a bunch of letters from um, various local jurisdictions to the FCC that are all, almost word for word identical, saying, how important it would be to be able to use these things and please FCC um, grant equipment authorization to this device because we need to fight crime and yada, yada, yada. Um, and so Harris, uh, in their request to the FCC, basically wanted uh, to request confidentiality for their application, otherwise it would be public. Um, and this is pretty typical for most things, so you can uh, pretty easily request that the schematics, the block diagram, the theory of operation, things like that uh, not be available to the public and you can claim, oh, it's a trade secret um, and you know that's why we, we want it all confidential. But for this application, they wanted everything confidential, including the photos, um, the, the test reports, all these things. And then they added something very weird in here. Um, they say to, uh, to further support Harris's request for confidentiality and to underscore the need for confidentiality, uh, Harris requests basically these two provisions to be added to the equipment authorization. Uh, and those two are basically that one, um, marketing and sale of these devices shall be limited to federal, state, and local law enforcement. Um, and that state and local law enforcement must uh, advance, coordinate, with the FBI um, for prior to the acquisition uh, or use of this equipment. And conveniently enough, the FCC uh, obliged and there's a copy of their equipment authorization and at the bottom there is basically just the, the word for word copy of what Harris requested. Um, and so uh, to actually get one of these things, you have to coordinate with the FBI and what that uh, involves is usually uh, signing a non-disclosure agreement uh, between uh, your local agency and the FBI. Um, so here's a typical letter that basically says, uh, thanks for signing that NDA, now you, can't, you are approved to uh, purchase uh, one of these uh, stingrays. But the NDA, which um, was uh, acquired through a, a public records request, has some interesting provisions. And I'm sorry, you probably can't read that, but um, basically one of the conditions was that um, the uh, Rochester Police Department in this case um, can't use uh, evidence that they collected from the Stingray devices uh, in any civil or criminal proceeding um, without uh, asking the FBI or Harris um, uh, first, um, and basically they wanted to keep information about these devices out of the court records um, at all costs. Um, so much that there's another pr uh, provision that basically allows the FBI to request um, that cases be dropped if the court requires uh, certain information about um, the stingrays uh, to be disclosed. Um, and this is really interesting. Um, uh, it shows how, how far they're willing to go to uh, try to protect some of this information. Um, but of course, you know, people tr um, have kept filing public records requests to, to try to get these uh, documents and information about how it works. Um, the ACLU uh, has been uh, suing uh, a bunch of places to try to get these records. Uh, they actually won a case in uh, Florida um, 
And the interesting bit there is right before they were about to go to the, the local uh, police department, the U.S. Marshal Service showed up and said, well, they were acting under our authority, so these documents about the Stingray are actually ours and we are seizing them. And by the way, they're federal records under a different, uh, under FOIA, not Florida's law. And so basically F you. Um, so uh, that's sort of uh, how the, the legal landscape works for, for MZ catchers. Um, now to talk a bit about how, uh, how we think law enforcement, uh, domestic law enforcement uses MZ catchers. Um, and so there's a couple of things that we can infer. So first there's something called tower dumps that can be used to gather identifiers of everyone in the area. Um, and occasionally these are used, I, I believe um, there was a person convicted for robbing a bunch of radio shacks and they found the person by doing tower dumps uh, at uh, the times when those radio shacks were robbed and just looked for a common MZ and that's how uh, they got them. Um, uh, so it's a pretty common tool um, and you know you can just sub subpoena them. Uh, if you want to do content interception, there is a law called uh, CALEA, the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act. And this was passed in the 90s as phone networks were going digital and you couldn't actually uh, physically tap lines anymore. And so there was a law uh, created that basically mandated that uh, these phone switches and phone companies um, have ways to enable uh, what was previously just an actual physical tap. And you know there are well-defined interfaces and processes and methods for doing this, so this is easier, cheaper, and more reliable than using an MC catcher to uh, intercept content. Um, and if you're using a, an MC catcher uh, because you uh, wanted to get around uh, getting a warrant, well, you still need a warrant to uh, intercept content. Anyway, so they're probably not using it for content interception. Um, so carriers can also abuse um, E91 functionality for localization. Um, so there's actually a ton of different protocols uh, that allow uh, carrier networks to query the phone for its precise position. For GSM, there's something called RRLP, and there are similar um, standards for 3G and LTE networks. Um, it's not clear whether uh, law enforcement has uh, the legal authority to compel um, providers to ping these phones um, and get their location because then they're actually doing something instead of um, just providing records that all, uh, already exist. But of course carriers just sell access anyway. Uh, so this uh, came out back in May where um, basically there are these websites that um, you can put in a phone number and it will give you uh, the location of the phone. Um, this uh, one uh, sheriff uh, was uh, actually charged with abusing uh, one of these services uh, to stalk someone. Um, uh, so that wasn't great. Um, there was uh, another site that lets you uh, get a demo of their product, um, which basically lets you put in your phone number and you ticked a little box that said yes I swear this is my phone number and it will show you the phone's location. Um, so after this came out uh, all the major carriers said okay we're suspending selling uh, uh, customer location data. Um, uh, unfortunately uh, a week or two ago there was this article that came out uh, on Motherboard where um, turns out yeah they're still selling it and they claim by March this is going to totally be cut off, but um, it's still out there. Um, they did the same thing in 2016. <laughs> yeah. So we were going to stop selling. Yeah, so. yeah. So, so we'll we'll see what happens. Um, as a side note, this was a very interesting announcement by Apple that said that uh, iOS 12 is going to uh, share your emergency location with 911. <laughs> Um, automatically and securely. And basically they were saying, oh, you know, this is a much better way of providing location. Um, I think what might be going on here is that Apple wants to get rid of support for the ability for carriers to ping your phone for locations. 
Um, and so they currently need that for uh, E911 location, but if they move to a completely different system, then the baseband processors don't actually have to support that request anymore. Um, so that's a very interesting thing that I think has gone mostly unnoticed. Um, so basically our conclusion from all this is that uh, MZ cache catchers are used for precisely localizing uh, particular subjects. So if you need to know uh, what door to knock down, for example, you would use one of these things um, to actually physically locate a phone. Um, because if you do this close in radio direction finding, that'll always be G GPS localization because GPS is terrible indoors and, and other things like that. Um, so to explain how uh, MZ catchers work, I want to talk a little bit about um, how cellular networks work. And I'll start back um, with uh, some pictures from this wonderful uh, uh, AT&T video back um, talking about uh, the new analog uh, cell phone system that they were introducing called AMPS. And basically in the pre-AMPS days, um, your car phone, which is what it had to be back then, um, was basically just a two-way radio uh, connected to an operator. And you had basically one big transmitter for an entire area, and then you had a couple of receive sites because the car transmitter um, wasn't as powerful. And basically it was just you know, a two-way radio um, with a little bit of, of logic in there um, for signaling. The problem with this system is uh, that there was uh, very few frequencies allocated for this, um, and uh, you couldn't reuse frequencies um, too closely. Um, so one of these uh, uh, market areas, um, I think, is about what's about 20 miles or so, and so you actually had to uh, you couldn't reuse the same frequencies for five times that distance. So if, it, if the area was uh, 20 miles wide, you actually couldn't reuse those channels until you were 100 miles away. And as they helpfully point out, that's about the distance between Philadelphia and New York. So obviously this system is not going to scale that well. So uh, to fix this, they introduced the concept of cells in the advanced mobile phone system, or AMPS. And the idea there is you break up the area into um, a bunch of these cells, and you have these units of seven cells uh, that you can basically tile as needed. And the nice thing about um, using uh, groups of seven cells is you can label them, and then if you just tile them, everything labeled with the same letter can reuse the same uh, channels without interference. And another nice property is that you can actually um, uh, do these cells at multiple sizes. Um, and so if you need to increase density or capacity, uh, you can just subdivide some of these cells into smaller cells. Uh, and it all works geometrically. There's no overlap. There's no uh, wasted space. Uh, it works out pretty nice. Now, in practice, cells don't really look like that, but it's, it's a, a good um, a good approximation of, of what's going on. Um, so the, the one problem with this is that this adds a lot of complexity to the network. So prior, uh, prior to the cell system, you just talked to one tower, you knew um, the, the network would know where, or it didn't need to know where you were, uh, it would just send it over its, its um, signal. Um, but with this system, now the network needs to know which cell you're in uh, to uh, actually route the calls to you. And so there's uh, a couple of things that happen there. So um, one is, well, if you're making a call um, and you're traveling between cells, um, the, the phone switch will uh, actually do a handoff between, uh, hand you off from one cell to the other. And your cell phone is constantly monitoring um, uh, it's uh, the neighboring cells, and the network is also monitoring um, your uh, signal strength and how well uh, your phone is being received, and it will decide uh, when and where to, to um, uh, route you. Um, 
So that, that's what happens when you're in a call or now in a data session, um, but when you're not actively doing anything, um, it doesn't, the network doesn't actually need to know where you are. Um, instead, it just needs to know basically what paging area you're in. And so when you receive an incoming call, um, it will send out a page into the uh, location area that you're in and it will go out onto all towers and then your phone will respond back to the tower that it's uh, currently listening to and say, hey, I'm here I'm, uh, on this cell. I would like to acknowledge this paging request. And then some signaling information gets passed back and forth uh, to set up the call. Um, and this paging scheme continues to this day even in systems like uh, LTE. Um, so just a bit about uh, GSM, um, because uh, I will be relevant for a few parts of the talk later. Um, GSM uh, improved on AMPs in several ways. Uh, one is that it used a voice compression. So um, a single voice channel in the old system could now hold uh, eight calls simultaneously. And they did that by uh, doing something called TDMA, time division multiple access, where they split up um, uh, each period into uh, eight time slots. And your call is assigned a frequency and a time slot and you send and receive on your assigned time slot. They also added encryption, um, so calls couldn't be intercepted over the air. And most importantly, at least from the phone company's perspective, they added uh, cryptographic authentication, so you could no longer clone a phone by just replaying its ID like you could with AMPs. And that was a, a major problem back in the day. Um, so, uh, and then uh, for some of these time slots, instead of uh, sending call information, they'll send some metadata, uh, like, um, Occasionally, they'll send a, a frequency correction burst, which allows the phones to precisely um, uh, adjust its local oscillator to, to precisely tune in um, uh, the tower. Uh, they'll send uh, broadcast messages uh, like paging requests, uh, system information messages that tell you uh, what network you're connected to, the cell ID, um, parameters for talking to the network, things like that. Um, and then there are some time slots used for just exchanging um, signaling of information, and those are known as uh, standalone dedicated control channels. Uh, and then they sort of multiplex this all in this crazy scheme where you have um, frames and multi frames and super frames and hyper frames, and it's, it's a mess, but uh, you know, it, it, it works. Um, one interesting thing to note here is now that you have time slots, uh, now you need to account for the speed of light. Um, because if you have two users who are transmitting um, on different time slots, but they're uh, physically separate, um, they might actually uh, overlap in time when they are transmitting, uh, when they think they're supposed to be transmitting. Uh, and so to get around this, um, when you first talk to the network, you send a, a random access request, um, which is actually a much shorter um, packet uh, uh, for the time slot. So it can um, actually be anywhere in that time slot uh, that says, hey, I would like access to the network. Um, you send that when you think you're supposed to send it. And then the tower actually says, hey, you're a, a bit late, and this is how many bits late you are and that's known as the timing advance, and that is sent uh, from the network back to the phone, and the phone uses that to compensate for its distance from the tower, uh, so that uh, when, its, um, when its burst is received by the tower, it uh, fits right into that time slot. Um, so basically, the way that phones work is that they uh, scan for, the cha uh, for channels, they find one that um, they think is on the carrier that they want. Uh, they lock on to the signal, synchronize uh, their timing with the, with the base station, and they start receiving these system information blocks, um, which contain uh, a country code, a network code, a location area code, which is that paging area, and a unique cell ID. Um, and again, uh, network configure, configuration parameters and also information about how to upgrade to 3G or LTE, 
Um, it'll say like you can talk to me on 3G on, on this frequency and LTE on this frequency. Uh, and it will also have a list of its neighboring cells so that the phone can periodically uh, look at the uh, other cells and see if they're better. Um, so the, the uh, initial registration in GSM goes something like that. And once again, I apologize for that being a little hard to see. But basically, the phone sends that random access request. Um, the tower then sends back an immediate assignment, which is basically assigning a, a standalone dedicated control channel to the phone to start communicating uh, metadata with. Um, the phone then uses that time slot to send what's known as a location area update, um, which uh, says to the network, hey, I'm in this uh, particular paging area now. Uh, you can reach me here. Now, if it's the first time that the network has heard from this phone, it will say, hey, wait a minute, I don't know who you are. Um, please authenticate yourself. And um, this, uh, it can also say, uh, please identify yourself. And so it can ask for your NC, it can ask for your IMEI, uh, it can, um, and then it can do a cryptographic challenge and response. Um, and uh, if it likes that answer, then it sends you, uh, sends the phone a location area accept and uh, the control channel is teared down. If it doesn't like you, it sends you a location area of reject and then the phone tries a different, uh, a different cell. Uh, so when phones are idle, uh, they scan um, the neighbors periodically and they decide when to switch uh, what cell they're, they're camped on. Um, uh, and they even do this uh, during calls and there's, uh, they send these measurements to the network um, and then the network decides when to do the handover. Um, during calls, the network can also control how much power the phone is transmitting, so it can ensure that the, uh, it isn't overpowering uh, the receiver or it isn't sending too little power. Um, and it will also periodically tell it what its latest timing advance is. So even as you keep moving, uh, it will um, uh, account for your distance from the tower and keep you in sync. And actually, LTE is pretty similar to GSM uh, in, in a lot of these uh, aspects. Um, but uh, instead of just time slots, they have these two-dimensional resource blocks. So instead of uh, assigning a time slot, they assign uh, a, uh, a block of time slots uh, and a block of frequencies. And so it's sort of a, a two-dimensional allocation now, and they can vary that size based on how much um, bandwidth you need. And it's all packet-based. There's none of this circuit switch stuff anymore. There's mutual authentication. Um, it's just better in, in many different ways. All right, uh, let's talk about what's known about MZ catchers. Um, Harris is the predominant vendor in the market. They uh, make the actual product called the Stingray. And most of what we know about this has come from either leaked or, or FOIA documents. Uh, and uh, a lot of them reference uh, the Harris devices, so we'll focus on those. Um, photos are rare, but um, of the photos that do exist, um, they, they suggest a lot of functionality of these systems. And actually in 2016, uh, a limited set of manuals were, uh, for these devices were leaked, uh, so we get to learn a bit more about how these devices work. So back to that word triggerfish from that 2005 document. This is actually um, uh, an AMPS uh, location and collection tool. Um, so you probably can't see it um, from where you are, but um, each uh, of these devices has six different uh, receivers, and they actually have headphone jacks, so you can actually listen in on, on the call. Um, and how this uh, seemed to work is you would program in the ESNs or MINs of the phones that you're interested in, and then when uh, it heard that being sent over the air, it would trigger on that and then um, allow you to listen in on that conversation. Um, and so you could use these to um, basically wiretap cell phones before Kalia. Um, interestingly enough, they, uh, so they also have interfaces down at the bottom for sending it to um, a, a recorder unit, um, but they also have this uh, DF out um, 
uh, port, which uh, is probably used for direction finding. Um, and so back, even back in the AMPS days, they were able to use uh, radio direction finding techniques um, to find a phone um, when it was transmitting. Um, unfortunately, it was receive only, so they actually had to be making a call to, uh, for you to find them. Um, but that, that was the limitation of, of AMPS back then. Um, a little bit later on, they made a device called the Gossamer. And this is a, a handheld MZ catcher. Um, and uh, there's some leaked marketing materials out there that uh, basically describe what it can do. So it can collect your MZ, your TIMZ, which is a, um, uh, basically a pseudonym that the network assigns to you so you aren't constantly sending your MZ in the clear um, and the IMEI. It can be used um, to either do a denial of service attack and knock phones offline. Uh, so you might use this to disable uh, IEDs, for example, or you can use it uh, with uh, an uh, amber jack antenna, which I'll talk about in a minute, to do radio direction finding. You can also use it with sort of a handheld uh, Yagi antenna, um, to, and you basically point it and where the signal is strongest, that's where the, um, the uh, phone is, is transmitting from. Um, this is the, uh, the original Stingray product. Um, this is, uh, again, for, for digital networks. Um, basically, it just has uh, some antenna ports, uh, uh, an external power amplifier port, and a direction finding antenna port, uh, and some USB interface. Um, then there's the Stingray 2, which um, basically added more SDRs internally. So there's four software-defined radios in here. Um, and they have uh, a different transmit port for each band that it supports and a different uh, uh, receive port for each uh, band. And it also has uh, a direction finding antenna um, port on it as well. Interestingly, there's a second version of the Stingray 2, which adds this 10 megahertz reference out connector. Um, and this is probably used um, when you're trying to uh, run these against CDMA networks, which require a uh, pretty tight uh, synchronization uh, with the network. Uh, yep. Uh, there's Kingfish, which is the man portable system, um, which uh, is basically meant to be worn uh, on you, and uh, they would sell it with this handy little uh, Bluetooth laptop, and uh, they would uh, communicate over Bluetooth, and you would use this to actually go and find people um, uh, uh, just walking around instead of in a vehicle. Um, if you are in a vehicle, though, um, you would commonly use one of these amberjack antennas to do the direction finding. And this is ridiculously expensive. It looks just, you know, kind of like an ordinary antenna with a, a magnet mount for uh, putting on the roof of the vehicle. Um, but it's, it's $38,000. Um, and even uh, one showed up on eBay once and it sold for like $19,000. Um, and I'll get into probably why it's that expensive in a bit. And then there are these things called harpoons, which are just power amplifiers for uh, taking the output um, RF from the Stingray and bringing that up to uh, a level, that, a higher power level. Um, there's now Hailstorm, which is basically the, their latest generation of, of MC catchers, uh, basically the same as Stingray 2. They're sort of wired up like this. Um, so you have uh, one of your Stingray units, and then you have a bunch of power amplifiers uh, connected to a bunch of antennas. Um, and basically, this is the only, um, the only uh, photo uh, of these in the wild. Um, a uh, 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 invoice was actually leaked out, which um, also suggests some capabilities. So they say that uh, you know this uh, Stingray is a four radio transceiver for registration, direction finding, isolation, and collection. And collection is an interesting term um, to certain people, um, uh, which suggests that it, it can uh, actually capture content. But none of the manuals we saw actually describes any of this. Uh, so. The manuals describe some of the functionality, um, and they reference Gemini mode, um, uh, which we think probably is just the, the direction finding and localization mode. Um, 
uh, it does talk about a GSM interceptor application, but is not described in detail. Um, basically, there's four modes of operation of this. The first is survey mode, where it identifies the towers in the area, um, and that's used to configure your Stingray. There's logging, which just looks at the, uh, the paging channel and will log what phones are being uh, paged. There's registration, which actually uh, then brings it up as a fake tower and collects MZs and either accepts them or rejects them. And then there's the uh, mobile station direction finding mode, which is used either with one of those Yagi antennas or an amber jack um, to actually uh, give you a, a heading uh, where the signal is coming from. And basically it works how we think it, it works. Uh, so it says, you know, uh, Rayfish system emulates the weakest surveyed neighbor of the strongest survey ch channel. And then they um, transmit modified system information messages, uh, including a different location identifier. And so when phones move between different locations, they have to send a location area update to the network to tell the network where it is. And uh, during that process, um, if uh, the MC is the one that it's interested in, it will accept that and join the network, otherwise it will re reject it and the phone will uh, either stay on its existing tower or find a different one. Um, and then in the direction finding mode, it basically tells, it sets up a silent call with the phone or otherwise en engages it to have it constantly transmit. Um, and uh, then it will ask the phone to increase its power to the maximum and then you can do direction finding on it. Uh, currently, uh, as of whenever these manuals are from, uh, LTE requires uh, a downgrade attack and uh, uh, basically, uh, you, as of then, you couldn't um, do direction finding on LTE. Uh, and basically, it logs everything uh, and then you can map it and uh, stuff. Um, Sometimes you get interesting emails. Uh, so there's this company called GunMax, which uh, that's their actual website. Uh, they sent us an email um, uh, asking for a, uh, uh, a quote for an MC capture. I don't think they knew what we do, but they <laughs> gave us the requirements. Oh, fortunately, you can't see them. And basically, it's a. Um, uh, probably uh, a list of exactly what the Stingray can do. So uh, typically companies will give out like, hey, here's what you put in in your uh, request for, for quotes, and um, then you know we have the exact thing that we can use to sell it to you. Um, so we you know basically found it does exactly what we think it does. All right, so how do these MZ catchers work? So again, you find the strongest cell, look at the neighbor list, find the weakest neighbor, uh, spoof the weakest neighbor with a different location area code. That causes a location area update. You can mess with this thing called a cell reselection offset, uh, which basically uh, tweaks um, the uh, cell reselection algorithm on the phone to make the cell seem more attractive. So it will try to uh, join your, your phone or your tower, even if the signal level is a bit low. Um, and they'll send to the location area update. The MZ catcher re, uh, says, I don't know what your TMZ is. Please give me your MZ and IMEI. Non-target phones are rejected and kicked back to the network and target phones will uh, be accepted and then probably put into that direction finding mode. And so this is what PCAPs from that look like. Um, so first, you know, it sends uh, a location area update request with its TMZ. Um, the tower says, who the hell are you? Please give me your IMEI. The phone uh, obliges, gives it the IMEI. Says, oh, and I also need your MZ2. And then it provides the MZ, and then it says GTFO. Um, <laughs> unless you're the target, and then it says, hey, here's your new TMZ. Welcome to the network. Um, and then uh, you keep talking to the phone, and you do these radio direction finding techniques. And there's a couple of different techniques um, that are that you can use. So the, the easiest one is you just point the a highly directional antenna and find the, the bearing with the strongest receive signal. There's also something called pseudo Doppler uh, where you can imagine an antenna rotating really fast 
And uh, as you're moving closer to the target, the frequency increases. As you're moving away from the target, the frequency decreases. And uh, this actually in, uh, adds a frequency modulation to a received signal. And based on the phase of that, you can figure out which direction it's coming from. Now, unfortunately, you can't rotate an antenna that fast. Uh, so you can do it with multiple antennas and just electrically switching between them. And then there's also this crazy beamforming technique where you have multiple antennas and you um, do some uh, weighted outputs of all the antennas to basically electrically sweep what is essentially a directional antenna and then you find where the magnitude is the strongest. So how we might accidentally build an MC catcher. So um, actually at UW, we have an FCC STA special temporary authority uh, that allowed us to do this, um, uh, basically giving us authorization to transmit on one of the European GSM bands. And so um, this was being used for a different uh, research project looking into community cellular networks, but uh, we also use this STA um, for some of these experiments. Um, so we set up uh, a network that we thought was our own. We had our own country code, our own network code. We, we're on a European GSM channel, things like that. And yet, and we even said, please only accept MZs that start with 91054. And yet, um, if you go over to that rejected MZ tab, you would actually see MZs um, of uh, real phones that were trying to connect to us because uh, our cell coverage in the building and so forth. Um, so how you might uh, detect these MZ catchers, um, it's basically uh, MZ catchers uh, change those system information blocks um, and they uh, abuse certain aspects of, of the protocols. Um, and so it's basically a matter of anomaly detection. And I'm going to have to go really fast here. Um, so you can look for things like a, a new location area code, an empty neighbors list. You might have that so phones don't um, migrate off of your MZ catcher. You look for weird cell selections, uh, weird uh, system information formats, um, lack of encryption, things like that. Um, these broadcast blocks sort of look like this in Wireshark. So you have like the cell identity and then you have a bunch of configuration parameters um, and things like neighbors lists, um, emergency call support flags, things like that, location update timer. Uh, and so how you go about looking for um, these uh, uh, these devices, uh, we had uh, initially a project called Seaglass. Uh, we wanted to do uh, citywide coverage at low cost uh, and basically collect all these uh, system information blocks. Uh, and we first focused on uh, uh, GSM first um, because that was easier at the time than looking at LTE. And basically we had this crazy setup, which was Raspberry Pi, GPS, a bait phone, a hotspot for data backhaul, a cellular modem to scan the network, and uh, because we have to power all these things, uh, the easiest way to actually power them is to get an inverter to go from 12 volts up to 120 volts, so you could then go through the wall works back down to five volts and power all these things. Um, so how are we gonna actually deploy these things? Well, they came up with an interesting technique that they call war sharing, which is a combination of the, the uh, traditional war driving technique with uh, ride sharing. <laughs> And so the idea is you put these in a bunch of Uber vehicles or Lyft vehicles uh, and you put them in, in uh, this nice black box in the trunk and uh, then they just drive around and every time the car turns on it powers up the system and just passively collects it. Uh, so how do you recruit drivers? Um, so the way that you do is you actually uh, request a ride and then <laughs> you say, uh, <laughs> would you like to uh, put this in your car? And then they usually respond with something like that. <laughs> um, so then you explain what it is, and, and the hit rate is pretty low, but eventually you do get some people. And um, ultimately, uh, you give them 25 bucks a week uh, if they're driving around 40 hours a week. And so you combine this incentives with taking a bunch of rides. So um, uh, the Peter and the, the other guy, Ian, who worked on this, basically went back and forth between a grocery store and a Starbucks 
uh, in Milwaukee several times, like 50 times, and uh, got a few people, recruited a few people, um, and then the, the drivers uh, recruited some other drivers. And we got a ton of data. We got um, basically 100,000 measurements per square kilometer. Uh, we ran this for two and a half months in Seattle and Milwaukee, and it basically came down to 62 and a half cents per driver hour. Um, so uh, on the left there is um, uh, basically a coverage map of Seattle and sort of that big red area is downtown. And then on the right there we have an animation basically of all the individual um, observation points uh, that we took. And we actually found some interesting anomalies. Um, the first was the uh, US Customs and Immigration Service building that um, around there had a, uh, we saw the same cell ID transmitting on six different physical channels. That's pretty weird. Um, and then uh, we also saw um, this one cell, which we see all the time around SeaTac Airport. One time and one time only, it had different parameters telling the phone to transmit at a different power level. Um, it uh, advertised the capability of receiving at different uh, receive levels. It had a different cell reselection hysteresis to keep uh, phones attracted to it more. And the uh, force location update timer was also modified. So that was a little interesting. Um, you know, we couldn't actually confirm whether these were actually MZ catchers or not. Um, uh, all we can say is, you know, it, it looked uh, pretty suspicious. Um, so, you know, this was, um, this is big and bulky. It, it kind of sucked in, in a variety of, of ways. It only got us partial system information blocks. We didn't get raw packet traces. We wanted to do direction finding and distance finding. And so we actually came up uh, with the Seaglass app. Um, so this is actually an Android app uh, combined with uh, the Osmocom BB software. Uh, so we ported Osmocom BB to Android because it's basically Linux uh, and have a, a UI for controlling that. Um, we actually re-implemented a, a user land USB driver so you don't have to root your phone and install drivers on that like we did for uh, the original version of this app. And basically you just connect this up using a USB on the go cable um, with a, a, a cable, a USB to serial cable that then goes into one of these Motorola C139 phones. And then basically you get uh, raw packet dumps. Uh, from this, uh, from whatever channel you're scanning. So you can scan the entire spectrum, uh, get all these measurements. Um, and then the other thing that it can do is it will actually ping the tower and say, hey, I want to talk to the network. And the network will say, okay, here's your assignment and here's your timing advance. So the network will then basically report how far away you are from the tower. Um, and then it puts this data into a SQLite database and you can export it to a KML file for mapping or PCAPs for analysis and things like that. And we will be releasing that later today um, on our GitHub site. Uh, it's not up yet for various technical reasons. Um, uh, but uh, anyway, so doing some of the, the data analysis on this is kind of interesting. Uh, so for example, based on the uh, timing advance, you can figure out basically uh, sort of a ring of where the tower could be. And uh, looking at two neighboring cells, you can actually see uh, the sectorization of this antenna. So this is along I-5 in southern Washington. And you can see um, uh, on one cell ID, I can receive it um, basically in, uh, in one direction. And um, uh, the other cell, neighboring cell ID is received um, as, uh, as I drive farther south. Uh, one interesting thing to note here, based on our accidental MZ catcher, is that the system that we used um, had buffering delays and will always report to be at least a kilometer away, um, actually two kilometers away, um, uh, because of this buffering delay and the software-defined radio. So assuming it reports the timing advance correctly, um, if you try to localize a tower, um, a, a, something built with an SDR, you'll never be able to get right on it. And that might be uh, a little suspicious. So we just built this. We haven't found anything suspicious yet, uh, although it's sensitive enough to differentiate uh, the various uh, 
uh, infrastructure vendors used by different markets. So for example, Washington DC here um, looks a lot like Las Vegas, but Seattle and Milwaukee look totally different, um, but Seattle and Milwaukee look uh, identical. We did find one misconfigured cell out in the, in the wild. Uh, basically, it reported the wrong channel number in one of its system information messages. Um, but uh, most exciting is that we are going to be uh, partnering up with a couple of different organizations to uh, be deploying this in a, a similar uh, war sharing model in several different uh, countries. And hopefully, I can talk about more, that more later. Um, so some future directions, we want to look at some physical layer features uh, such as frequency and timing offsets because we think you, know, you don't actually need to be as precise or synced to the network um, to run an MZ catcher. Um, you just need to be good enough while the actual networks uh, are, are, um, uh, have pretty high standards. Uh, right now, this is just GSM only. Uh, we have another project that we're working on that was kind of spun out from that called Spyglass, which is Seaglass, but using SDRs with Raspberry Pis. Um, we want to take these timing advances and actually localize towers with them. And you have to use sort of probabilistic models because things like multipath reflections and things like that, you can't totally rely on the timing advance. You'll, you'll get some weird thing, so there's like a distribution curve of distance versus timing advance. Uh, and then we're also working on some radio direction finding hardware uh, to locate uh, suspicious towers. All right, so in conclusion, MC captures are now cheap and ridiculously easy to make even accidentally. There's basically no expertise to, to um, do this. You just get like Blade RF and Yate BTS and you're up and running. Um, Network and cellular protocols can assume that rogue cells are uh, um, an unreasonable threat. Um, you know, US government is very concerned about MZ catchers uh, here in DC. Uh, so it's important that we uh, resolve these underlying security issues. Looks like 5G might be solving some of these, but also there might be some issues there. Um, stay tuned. Um, MZ catchers were designed for highly adversarial environments where you can't get carrier cooperation. Um, so why is domestic law enforcement using it? Is it just a military contractor looking to expand its market? Uh, is it the, the lack of a, a, a legal standard uh, or lower legal standard? Um, uh, do they lack the authority to compel carriers to providing location? Um, or can the carriers not support direction finding at all? So uh, basically we think that um, the these agencies need to open up uh, and allow us to have a conversation about alternatives. Um, because it seems like MZ catchers do trample on real networks and um, might actually pose some safety issues like interfering with 911. Um, they definitely still seem helpful for close in direction finding that you just can't do any other way, but it might be possible for the carriers to actually support doing that um, by uh, having the real network engage the phone so you can do direction finding. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and point you to that website where we will put, uh, put more information about the app and where you can get it and all that good stuff uh, later on today. So thanks.